Yeah, hello and welcome to this video. Is the recording actually on? I think it is. So this is the chess opening Q&A video number two. So this is the first one um, based on your questions that have been posted in the first video. Um, I actually disabled further comments in the first video. So I have a, yeah, I have the opportunity to um, yeah, look at all of them. And this is um, the only way um, yeah, to do it, I think, efficiently. If if I keep all those videos open, the old ones, then people keep asking questions in old videos and I kind of lose track completely. So I'm going to do it like that. I'm going to close the comments for the first one and let leave them open for this, for the current one. Maybe I will go for some other solution at a later stage and don't do it with YouTube comments. But for now, let's do it like that. So if you have additional questions, post them right in the comments to this video. Okay, in the first one, I got really tons of uh, comments, roughly 40 or so. And I want to um, make those videos, um, I don't want to make them like two hours long, three hours long or something like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm taking the questions here from the first video and make a roughly 30 minutes video of it. And if it's 30 minutes, I'm going to call it a day and I'm going to make um, or look at the other questions at video number three. So it will be uh, probably like a collection of questions that will that, <clears throat> that will be um, answered over time. So I'm not going to make so long videos that nobody's going to watch them. It's my experience. Two hours is a bit much. So let's get rolling. The first um, question from the first video is, can you cover the Porth, Porth Mouth Gambit? Um, thankfully, uh, Zuba is telling me what this is. I wouldn't have known that this is uh, called Porth's Mouth Gambit. Porth's Mouth, I'm probably um, butchering this. Um, um, well, I'm not sure. Um, he, he wants to know if this is playable in over the board chess. His opponents are rated around 1800 to 2000. Okay, first of all, I wasn't aware that this is an opening. Um, but um, I looked at this briefly and I think um, it is probably something that you can do on that level that you're mentioning. It is obviously a gambit. Um, one part um, of the question is, what white should do after black plays e5. This is not a move that I would consider as black at all because b4 is a pawn you simply take and don't play some silly move like e5. Um, anyway, I think that uh, b5 there should be better for white. Something like this must be a bit better for white, probably with bishop c4. I analyzed this briefly, um, not, um, yeah, it's not something that I looked at like an hour or so, but I think it's fine. And I would play b5, um, even though a move like bishop c4 is probably playable. I think e5 is, frankly speaking, a pretty weird move. But um, yeah, the critical line um, of this opening has to be knight takes b4, I think. And after that, white is playing like this. So what white is basically doing is he's playing a c3 Sicilian, um, but with a missing b pawn and an extra tempo. Yeah. Best for black, I would uh, assume, is d5 here. Yeah? And then after this, yeah, white has a choice what to play. There moves like knight d2, knight a3. I checked it briefly. White seems to have a bit of compensation. I think this is um, a little bit dicey. It, it wouldn't be my cup of tea to play something like that. But if you don't mind a bit of risk, and um, I think it's kind of okay, you would probably surprise many people. And... I'm not sure what people would actually play there if they don't know um, what to do. People might take this, and this, um, <clears throat> this for example, is something that um, I know is kind of interesting. <clears throat> Sorry for the voice. So um, I think it's playable. It's too risky for my for my uh, personal taste, but it's um, certainly something that you can do against this opposition. Um, <clears throat> a question here by Till Chess is the um, are D pawn systems like the collar or very soft okay for fourteen hundred players? 
Yeah, of course they are. They are fairly solid and simple to learn. Um, given the choice between the collar um, and other DPON systems or the Verisoft, I would really, if you want to do something off beta share, I would really advocate the London. Um, the the very soft is not bad. Yeah, like this is the very soft with the Nylon C3. But um, oftentimes you want C4 and later yeah, you want to play C4 and you can still do that with the London. I think the London is an easier entry point maybe for later expansion to more uh, mainline openings. For example, if black plays something slowish, let's say, yeah, I would strongly advocate to play C4 and play, play C4, D4 style opening that you can later use. The experience that you get here with more typical D pawn opening play can be useful later. While the very soft um, is such a such an isolated part, let's say, of, of structures that it's kind of you're, you're gaining knowledge, but of, of an area that is probably not super useful in the very long run. With the with the London, this is a bit more. It's a bit more flexible. The collar, um, this is this is with E3, is of course playable. But I wouldn't really do that if I have the Bishop F4 option. It's just more active. So given the choice, I would probably I have a piece of paper actually. I would probably rather go for the London. Um, so um, there's um, a question about the Queen's Gambit accepted with black. I'm still going to keep it from the white perspective. I'm switching boards all the time. It gets tricky. So um, and here um, Jacob is asking um, his systems with uh, this e4 and knight c3 is giving him a hard time. OK, first of all, knight c3 is not great because of the move a6. This is something that you should check. Um, white is actually now a little bit struggling um, to be um, still OK, let's say. White is still OK, but he has to be very, very uh, careful. In some cases, you have excellent chance to even keep the pawn. A line that is oftentimes seen in games is this, for example, where all of a sudden, this funky knight covers the pawn. This position, for example, is already better for black. So knight c3 is viewed as an imprecise move. It's still a move that is played quite often on the amateur level. So it's something you should be ready for. Against e4, my recommendation is to play knight f6. There are other options, but I think knight f6 is the most straightforward, mostly because the lines now are fairly clear. Knight c3 is not good due to e5. Please check the details. I cannot show everything. This is good for black. So they go e5, knight d5, bishop c4. And here you have a choice between the moves knight c6, knight b6, or bishop f5. The latest uh, fashion is bishop f5, a move that I have played sometimes in my blitz games, and I think will catch white players unawares. One uh, interesting point is that after queen b3, or main point in fact, is that c6 is playable because queen b7, knight b6 is actually fine for black. I've had this in my blitz game, so check them out. Um, this is a fairly simple recipe against the queen's gambit accepted with e4. And um, you have a big advantage there that you can play on move 5, a line that white players probably never have seen. This is a very nice thing if you can do that. So this is what I would do in the QGA, absolutely. And then here the question um, that I don't quite understand, honestly. Uh, Michael3141, he's going back, he's saying, his question is about fighting against a Slav setup with the white pieces when starting with c4. I like playing aggressive and sound chess recently discovered there is the following gambit line. And he's giving this line, c4, c6, knight c3, d5, d4, d takes c4, e4, b5. What is my opinion on this line? Would you recommend this line for an aggressive player who strives to get an imbalanced position as possible but still sound? And the yeah, thing is, this is a line that black plays, right? I mean, black is taking on c3. 
And this is a sideline. Black usually does not take on c3, but they most of the time play knight f6 for regular Slavs. And the question here is a little bit, um, what exactly are you aiming for with knight c3? You can do that. That's not a bad move. But um, what is your idea with knight c3? dc3 is a sideline. Uh, dc4 is a sideline. And after e4, b5, you will probably play a4 and want the pawn back. Otherwise, you're probably in a shady gambit. Yeah, some Something like that is the Geller gambit, which is generally viewed as unsound for white. It's not unplayable, but not um, something that is very commonly seen. Here, white usually plays like this. And then we get um, get this as the main line, um, which is playable for white, absolutely. But the thing is, you are cho choosing this move here, uh, or you can also do this move order. And um, you, you need some justification for that, because if you just want to play this, uh, for example, I see little point in starting with knight c3 instead of knight f3. So knight c3 does not have huge advantages over um, doing this. Um, there are differences, but for example, here if black plays e6, you have e4. So maybe knight c3 is the more aggressive move in some way. But if black plays knight f6, which will happen in the absolute majority of cases, you need to ask yourself what your move is. If you play knight f3, you just have a transposition and you can play e3. But if you want to play with e3, you can argue that maybe um, the other way around, like, like this, has more points because um, in, this case, in this case, you sometimes have ideas where you can actually develop the knight here, for example, with b3, bishop b2, knight d2, and later knight e5. So I'm not totally sure that I understand the question. I mean, if the question is, is knight c3 playable? Yes, yeah, you can play like that. Um, is it a promising gambit? I wouldn't say so. I think that in most cases, um, like with a4, the material quality will be restored quite quickly. If you just don't do anything here and play something like this, I think black has quite decent chances to be okay with knight f6, Geller gambit, or e6 transposing to a line of the notable. Um, I'm not really a huge believer in just like playing like this and just develop pieces. I mean, yes, you have a center, but black has an extra pawn, and those pawns are actually quite annoying. So I think here it will ultimately come probably to this position. And you can also go to b1, but knight a2 is more common to, to this position, which is fine for white. But it's it's your call. If you want to allow this, um, most of the time it's not relevant because black will do something else. Um, knight f6 in particular, like knight f6 here. The next question here by Peter Gasper is he's got a problem with white against the Benko gambit and with black uh, against the king's gambit. So, yeah, this is um, an easy one, relatively easy one. So with white, you don't like the Benko gambit. The first option that you can have is, and that depends on your repertoire, if you play knight f3 based quite often, you could, of course, just do this, which stops the Benko. Yeah, after c5, d5, b5, you are not... Um, as you're not forced to play c4 to transpose to the banco, but you can play bishop g5, which is uh, rather dangerous for black. I mean, I've compiled a banco gambit repertoire where I have this with black as my recommendation, but it is tough to play. It's not easy to play and uh, quite nice, actually, for white, I think, as a practical weapon. If you need to play c4 and uh, get into this position, you have the option to decline it with knight f3. That's not, not a bad idea. But I would actually recommend to, to uh, select a line within the Benko. I don't know what you have tried, of course. That would be helpful to know. But um, if you want an option that is not um, so sharp and relatively easy to maintain, I would... Um, recommend to take the pawn and after a6 play b6. That's a good practical recommendation. Black um, will regain the pawn. Most of the time he will take immediately. 
and then you play a setup with knight c3, knight f3, e4, knight d2, knight c4. It's the general plan. Black loses a bit of time with the screen moves and without the a file open black hasn't uh, does not have such clear counterplay i think um black is okay with precise play of course but this is something that gives you very good control and it is quite easy to learn this is much easier to play for example like a sharp line like f3 or uh, i know there are some gambit style lines that are not very correct um, I would um, recommend this. Um, you can also study to take the pawn, but this is much more work. So I think b6 is a good practical weapon if you want to cut down on theoretical workload. Um, there's the question about the king's gambit, what to do with black. Um, a line that um, he mentions is, is this one. This is something that I had recommended in uh, on my YouTube channel in an earlier video some years ago, and it's still a good line. Um, he's, he says he still has some problems there. However, after I've looked at this very extensively for my uh, fight e4 la Caruana repertoire, which is a full e4, e5 repertoire, so I have to cover the king's gambit, um, I'm absolutely certain <laughs> that taking is best. And now after bishop c4, queen h4 is good for black. And after knight f3, knight f6 is also good for black. So the king's gambit is just not good for white. It's what it is. If white is very precise, very, very precise, I think it could be equal. But white is struggling to prove that. So if you want a really hard weapon against the king's gambit play like that, you will be better in almost every game. Because it's not even so well known. Um, yeah, like after this, you go here and protect the pawn from the side and now attack this pawn formation. It is still quite murky, but objectively speaking, black is fine. This is an opening, for example, that is for me completely dead for correspondence chess or computer chess. It's just white is just not good, in good shape. Um, Peter also has a question about um, the Italian game. He says he gets very boring positions of the Italian. Um, and want something more interesting. I do understand what you say. I have the same issue. Um, and this is why I cannot answer the question like offhand. Yeah. Um, it's something that I'm going to uh, keep in mind and I need to check maybe some ideas to give, um, give some advice, but not like immediately. I, I don't have a solution really. I mean, in the Italian, black is sound and solid, but it's not super exciting. Um, the next question by Lukas is about the queen's gambit accepted with knight f3. And he, he has a very general question. I should analyze typical white plans after 6a6. What he means is uh, the position here. Which is the absolute main line of the QGA. Um, I mean, it's a bit tough to analyze this and because white has <clears throat> um, a boatload of moves, really, a huge array of moves. I can give you some advice, though, some general advice, um, what I would play, let's say, if I'm in this position. If I want super solid, yeah, you can take on c5, which um, is probably equal, but black still has to prove it. It's still a little bit, a little bit more comfortable for white. It is not very exciting though, as you will trade queens now immediately. If you want solid, but with a little bit more bite, yeah, I would play b3. This is currently in fashion. The idea is simply to develop the bishop. And in case of c takes, take with the knight and get a position, uh, this is of course nonsense, sorry, black has to start with bishop d7 in order to prepare that. To get a position like that, where white has a slightly easier game, and the bishop on b2 is just a good piece. So um, honestly, if I'm in this position, which I'm usually not, just for repertoire reasons, I play something else with white, I would play b3. If you play, um, want to play sharper, you want a sharper position, I would recommend to play bishop b3 or bishop d3. Those two moves 
um, tend to lead to IQP positions that are a bit sharper. The reason why you move the bishop voluntarily is that you want to answer b5 with a4. So if you want to play sharper, I would go for one of the bishop moves. And if you want to play more solid, I, want to, I would want to play b3. This is my current take uh, on this. What does not seem to be too promising is queen e2, the very old main line. It's not a bad move, but it doesn't seem to pose black many problems. Also, there is a4, which also seems to be fine for black currently, I think. So I hope this, uh, this helped a little bit. Um, there is a question here, how to use chess base um, to search for lines. This is um, a little bit, um, yeah, it doesn't quite fit into this, um, into this concept, maybe. Um, it's something that I keep in mind, maybe, for a separate uh, type of video. The next question, um, an opening psychology question, and uh, I think a very important one. Um, if a player plays into an opening line, which you know extremely well, should you move instantly to show dominance and at best instill fear? Or do you should or should you act like you know nothing and uh, whatever? Yeah, to put on some kind of show. Uh, I have a very clear advice there, and you don't mention spending time. This is an important thing because sometimes people ask me if I actually know everything, should I still spend a bit of time, like I put on a show that I'm not, um, yeah, that I'm not knowing stuff. And my clear advice is don't do that. Just play the move immediately. Yeah, just. Play immediately. Asserting dominance is helpful. To, like showing that you know stuff is generally helpful, and simply, um, yeah, convert your knowledge into advantage on the clock. Being ahead on the clock is super useful. In particular, if you are the stronger player, anyway. The recipe of having a good opening position against a somewhat weaker opponent with more time on the clock that translates into so many points you cannot count it. However, if you have a decent, good position, whatever, and you burn time for no reason, it can be um, it can be a problem. I have had games where I had, like, if you play increment chess, where I had my starting time on move 20, simply because I knew what I was doing, and then I just play the moves. I mean, you don't have to blitz it, but just, like, play, play them quickly and uh, don't put on any sort of show. I don't think there's much benefit uh, to that, yeah? I really don't think so. Um, but this is maybe an attitude kind of thing. I, I really don't don't care so much about psychological place or whatever. I don't think it, it helps too much. Having more time on the clock is, is very useful. Um, yeah, the next one is uh, not a real question. It was a comment on the on the video and uh, that I did. The first one was about the uh, about recommendations, what to do against d4, that looks a little bit like the Alekine. And that's true. There is a mention here by Mitriel Jack that this is Alekine type style play. Absolutely, you're right. I did not mention that opportunity. The Queen's Gambit accepted with e4 is a lot like the Alekine in this variation. Very similar, in fact. Um, and uh, would work, definitely. Um, however, of course, in the QGA, there are other lines than e4, so this is not a full-scale solution. And it's a bit more difficult to play um, off beatish a little bit off beatish or elegant like uh, against other lines. There are still possibilities, though. The QGA is an opening that I generally think is quite fine. Um, the next question by Roland Magel. I'm actually managing quite a lot here. I hope I'm not talk talking too fast, but... I think uh, it's kind of okay. Um, he says he um, plays solid but not completely sy symmetrical opening with black, like the Karo Khan against e4 and the QGD against d4. He always has problems though with playing against knight a3 or c4. What would you recommend to play? Um, well, if you play the QGD, it's not a big problem. Eh? You just play e6 and d5. Hmm. Yeah, and whatever white does, that is not d4, will be ready where you should um, look look at some lines and make a choice. Um, the only uh, problem could be, and you're not um, you're not um, mentioning this, um, that you might um, go for the QGD with other move orders. That is possible if you play 
For example, against d4, if you play something like this and only play the QGD here, and let's say here you play something else, you play the Nimzo, yeah? um, then against c4, it's a bit more of a problem. But generally speaking, e6 is, of course, the way to go. In many cases, you will transpose. For example, after knight c3, d5, d4, you have a QGD, and now your choice. Um, if you play the semi-Tarash, um, then I assume that you play this. Not a big problem. The only thing that White can do is he can just play without d4. <coughs> so he could try things like, let's say, this. And here you need to make a choice. You say you play the bishop before Catalan. Okay, that means that this is a bit of an annoyance because there is no check on before. Hmm. Okay, it's not the end of the world though. I would simply uh, learn something that is specific to this. So, for example, interesting lines that you can play here are taking. This is the most solid line. Or you can play the sharper line d4. Simply playing as if you were white and gain space like this, 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 which is a, a Benoni uh, with reverse colors. White actually has two tempi. It's, it's funny, I know it's a lot because he's white and e6, e5 will be two moves, but it's still probably quite okay for black. So it is ambitious, but it's, it's, it's playable. Um, I would do one of those or you can, of course, play bishop e7, castles, and so on, and just uh, allow a different line of the Catalan. Um, if you don't want to do that, I recommend to take or play d4 for, for a sharper play. Against knight f3, of course, uh, d5, d4 will transpose, c4, e6 is basically what we just looked at. And white, of course, can play stuff like g3. And here again, you need to make a judgment call what to do against this. You've got quite a good range of options. You can still play knight f6, e6 and await proceedings. Or what I think is quite interesting uh, is to play very ambitious here with c5 and knight c6, trying to play e5. Many people, especially if they are not super strong and don't know the opening that well, will actually allow e5, which basically gives you the white pieces in a king's Indian. Or they play the um, the reverse Grunfeld. This is a good opening, I think, for white, not like white wins or anything, but I think it's an attractive option for white. However, if you know your stuff, you can be very okay there as well. It's well, it's equal, maybe, yeah, if you be if you are precise, but this is the only, let's say, problem variation for black if you play like this. Everything else is fine, really. Sometimes white tries stuff like this, the reverse Benko, but this is honestly not very good. Yeah, you take the pawn and you are happy. I mean, the tempo is actually not very relevant. So this is an ambitious option against knight f3. Um, of course, you can do e6 and b be solid as well. There's there's quite a good quite good amount of of choice there. Um, the next question by Matt George is the following. Are systems with d5, e6, and a6 viable as a main repertoire against d-pawn openings or only as an occasional deliance? I don't even know that word. I learned a new word, deliance. Um, given that those lines are nowadays played by people like Carlsen and Caruana, it is probably fine, yeah? We're talking about a6 here or a6 here. Um, it depends um, probably a little bit on your level of opposition if you want to play it every single game. The idea of the move, by the way, is to prepare the capture. On a good day, you might capture and keep the pawn. Um, I don't really want to go into this um, in much detail um, because it is a fairly broad subject. Yeah, white can play many moves and there are some ideas there. As you probably gather, I have looked at this for black already. Um, it is interesting. Um, I think you could give a go. Um, I could, could, you could give that line a go as a, as a main choice because it's still not in the focus of any white player. Who knows this stuff? A6, nobody. 
And I don't think you can refute it by preparation. I mean, that, that would have happened then. Yeah, Carlsen has played it again. And yeah, if Magnus is kind of experimental sometimes in the opening, but he's not going to play something that doesn't work. <laughs> okay, the next, um, the next question, um, a simple line against the Trompowski. That's the Tromp. Yeah, what to do there? Is there something simple? Um, I'm not certain. It's sometimes difficult to tell what people perceive as simple and and not so simple. Um, the probably easiest move is d5. Let's start with that, where you allow white to take. This cannot be super scary, honestly. I mean, black has um, a fairly easy development and no weaknesses. The double pawn is not an issue. Oftentimes, white does not even take, but plays something like e3, after which c5 or knight e4 are, are options. Um, d5 is probably the simplest. Um, a line that is a bit more ambitious, maybe, that I played um, a bit in the past is e6. It is ambitious because now if white plays knight f3 or knight d2, that is kind of toothless. You can play c5 and b6 then. The only really interesting move is e4, after which you can play uh, h6 and now gain the bishop pair. Um, yeah, if you, if you know me, yeah, I always like to have the bishops. Um, and this is why I was attracted to that line. I have to say, though, white also has some uh, good ideas here. White oftentimes plays a setup with um, what I'm doing here, bishop d3, knight d2, knight e2, c3, later f4. However, this is the only thing that is kind of puzzling here for black. So if you um, look at this a little bit, you should be okay in a position that is a bit more unbalanced. Maybe this is an interesting way for you to play. Um, it depends also a little bit on what kind of stuff you play if white plays mainline. Yeah? If you play something really dynamic like the King's Indian or so, then you can also think of course about moves like c5 or knight e4 and c5. I recommend c5 in my Benko Gambit repertoire and I see no problem with the move either. It's just um, the most, it's a very sharp reply. You need to study it a little bit more. If you want something a little bit unbalanced um, and still um, not a huge workload, maybe e6 is something. In particular, if you like the bishop pair, it's a good choice. Um, okay, um, the next one, the next one is um, something that we had already about the QGA with e4. Um, and here, the, ah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, not that others are not good. It's just like it's a it's a very common question that I sometimes get. It's about this again in the QGA. Why isn't White developing his black squared bishop here? Um, the most common move here is e3, and basically the question is, what about bishop f4? What about bishop g5? So let's look at bishop f4. Yeah. Um, the problem with this is. This is delaying the recapture of the c4 pawn. And you're not entirely sure that you get it back. It is simple as that. If black plays, for example, the move a6 now, it's not the only one, but let's say a6, how exactly do you get the pawn back? If white now plays e3, I play b5. You play a4, I play bishop b7. Do you get the pawn back? It's not so clear. One problem is that this bishop is actually not doing anything. And in some cases, it can be a problem if black plays a quick bishop to b4 and possibly not, possibly knight d5. For example, I know that it's a bit cooperative, but um, yeah, it's very cooperative. But let's say something like this, e6, and then, yeah, I mean, why everybody will castle here, right? <laughs> but yeah, even knight d5 can be a problem. So you, you're not sure to get the pawn back. With e3, you are. Yeah, you will get it back. I mean, black can try stuff like b5, but after a4, he's not able to keep the pawn ultimately, because here the whole play is just quicker. Yeah, you don't spend the time on bishop, uh, the time on bishop f4. 
Um, one thing that I also want to mention is that this move bishop f4 kind of, um, or bishop g5 for that matter, it kind of has this uh, feel to it that you fear that after e3 your bishop could be bad. This is not happening, this is not a bad piece because um, you automatically will improve the bishop because black cannot play this without playing c5 and to have some kind of uh, conflict in the center when the bishop will automatically improve. So this is not a problem. It's not that this piece is stuck on the square. For example, if we look at this, if white, uh, if black does something very slow, let's say some nonsense, bishop e7, this, 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 you will always manage e4 and the bishop is in play. Or they play better, they play c5, you castle, they take, the bishop is in play. Or something like this happens, you play b3, bishop b2, as mentioned before, this is a line, your bishop becomes active on the diagonal. So you don't really need this move, and e3 is just making sure that you get the pawn back. Yeah. Um, the next question, I might be getting to almost all of them here, that's cool. What would I recommend uh, to an 1800 player who likes offbeat aggressive lines to play against the Scandinavian? Offbeat and aggressive lines, okay. Um, yeah, that's not so easy. Actually, the Scandinavian is something where you don't really need so much offbeat um, because the best lines are aggressive anyway without, let's say, gambiting a pawn. I would probably just play a main line, yeah, like knight c3 and now um, play one of the main lines. In my keep it simple e4 repertoire, I advocate to simply develop like this and it leads to sharp play. You often get knight e5 and g4 in against bishop f5. Um, this is certainly an option. Just play main lines because they are automatically aggressive. If you don't play aggressively against a Scandinavian, black is fine anyway. So if you play lame stuff, he will equalize. Um, an interesting line that you could think about is this, knight f3, intending to play d4, c4 and not block the knight. Um, this will lead to sharp play because you get to this kind of situation quite, uh, quite, to uh, quite typically. And here there are some interesting lines. Um, I did not look at this before. What do we play d4 before? I think you have to play d4 here. Castles. No, there was some b4 stuff. This, this, h3. There is some line here where white plays b4. Hmm. That here? I don't know. There are some funky lines here because of the, um, of the, um, opposite side castling. It can get very sharp and maybe this is something that you could explore. I would still re recommend playing the main lines here because they are aggressive and they pose um, some yeah, quite clear problems for black. Not that black is in terrible uh, shape or so, but just uh, aggressive is like normal against the Scandinavian. It's not like you get a boring position. Um, Okay, the next question. Um, if I can use this video series to answer questions on my chessable repertoires. Um, sure, you can ask specific questions. Sure, that's, uh, that's possible. Um, yeah, now the next question is very um, general. Um, by Noah, he asks uh, when a4, a5 or h4, h5 is useful in an opening. Um, I sometimes say this look, looks logical and so on, but um, he does not see the logic. Um, this is a bit too general to answer. There are those flank pawn pushes in some lines, but um, it is um, a bit difficult to answer that without having some concrete examples. So if you, um, if you see the video, Noah, Noah Davis is the name, Maybe you can give me one or two cases where you don't quite get why you would push A or H-pawn and I can answer that a bit more specifically. Um, 
The, the next question is if I could do something about the English attack in the Nidorf with bishop e3. This is um, what it is all about. This is the English attack in the Nidorf. Um, yeah, honestly, this is a bit vague. Yeah? I mean, it's a bit difficult to make a full-scale video about this because black has tons of setups and even then it's 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 huge yeah it's just a it's, it's a big range of stuff um i'm happy to answer a more specific question i cannot just make an overview about this opening i would sit there for 20 hours to even get a vague idea um in particular like this is a total main line it's easier to say something about a side line um maybe you have a bit a bit more of a concrete question there then i can uh, try to answer it i cannot just do an opening survey on it um okay um there's a question here about if it is um it's a useful thing uh, for learning an opening to play the other side of the opening against an engine so just to check what positions you end up with um yeah i'm not so convinced that this is a good idea I usually recommend to um, simply uh, test out your opening against humans in blitz, blitz chess and rapid chess, and then make a um, yeah statistical analysis: what worked, what didn't work, what positions uh, were fine, where you got problems, these kind of things. It's much more important to test it against um, decent human opposition because it's a clearer picture of what humans actually would play. The engines are often so far away from normal chess that um yeah i don't know if it is helpful i mean you should use the engine maybe to prepare the opening and look at some stuff but i wouldn't play against it it's just too big of a mismatch um okay the next question is also about playing the engine to prepare again i don't think it's um it's a great idea um oh ah, yeah um a reliable setup against the karo khan yeah this is this i can answer so this is the karo and um white has some interesting options there what i recommended in my book is the two knights and um yeah some other uh, viewers of the video um put this in the text already they re said that i recommended that i'm still happy with the recommendation it is not um super simple yeah it is in fact um, a somewhat poisonous line that quite often claims victims because people have no clear idea what to do against it um it's still not um something that you can learn like in 10 minutes yeah it's a bit more more effort and um, if you want a clearer option or a simpler option um you can of course play the exchange variation this has been mentioned um in the, in the comments there and i have to agree that if you want to make it even easier than the two knights even though at the cost of not having so much i think trap potential um then this is a good choice one thing that um i think is interesting to keep in mind is that after d4 d5 bishop f4 the london um this is played a lot nowadays on all levels yeah we were talking about up to magnus and one of the main replies to this move is c5 after which the the top guys all play e3 and now black has the option to take on d4 which they actually don't do all that often but they could do that and after e takes, we get the exchange Karo with bishop to f4. This is not the most common move, actually. Yeah, if we go to this again in the Karo exchange, the main move is bishop d3. If you don't want to play c4, of course, is bishop d3. But this is just a transposition to um, a position that many many strong players are willing to play with white and that is that says something and 
strong black players don't actually take on d4 in the London move order. So that means that probably there is some kind of, there is some potential maybe here. So this is something that I would recommend if you want something extremely simple, that is even simpler than <laughs> my recommendation in the book. Um, the advantage in terms of simplicity is the pawn structure. You define the pawn structure super early on. It is, however, unlikely that you win quickly. Yeah, um, In the two knights, oh, there was a misclick. I'm sorry about that. In the two knights, for example, let's say if I play a couple of blitz games against a typical opponent, 17, 1800, they oftentimes simply play this and... Um, I have won so many games in this trappy line. Okay, I know it's quick, yeah? Mate threat was on f7. I mean, I've, I've, I've had this on the board maybe in 20 blitz games already against decent players. And I've seen even IMs or IM level players easily go into this position, which is basically lost. Yeah, it's basically lost. Um, this is also very strong, by the way that wins wins a pawn, which is actually what I have in the book. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a choice. You can play the bishop c4 stuff, which is great, or this is what I do in blitz, because oftentimes the game is just over on move 15, but objectively stronger is even this, what I have in the book, where black simply loses a pawn for no compensation. This is just one tricky line. There are some others with the two knights that can help to win some quick games. You don't do that in the exchange, but the exchange is, again, is even simpler to learn. Wow, there was a bit of a tour de force, but I actually looked at all of the questions that could be answered in that format. There was a question about something interesting about um, um, something interesting against the Italian, which I am, again, I don't really know something myself that is really exciting. I'm happy to share this information if I came across it, but I currently also don't have the time to analyze for hours and hours to find something funky in the Italian. Yeah, okay, so this was a 47 minute video then, so a bit longer than intended, but I actually have a reasonably clean plate after the first video. So if you have further questions or want to um, be more precise about some of the questions that you had, in some cases, as I mentioned, I need a bit more info to, to talk about it, um, then uh, please um, add a comment and uh, be more um, yeah, precise or just make a clearer question out of it, like what to do specifically against this. I cannot do a huge overview of a mainline opening. Okay, guys, hope you enjoyed it. Till next time. Bye-bye.